Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new Mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this usually every single week, so if you think that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. I just want to quickly thank you all so much for your patience over the last few weeks. If you saw my last um, community post or if you follow me on Instagram, you will know that I have not been very well over the last month or so. I had a cold and then that started to get better and go away, but then I developed some kind of infection, like a throat or a chest infection. I'm not entirely sure exactly what it was, but I was prescribed antibiotics by my doctor and I was told by him to go on voice rest until um, I'd finished the course of antibiotics. So obviously I couldn't film any videos and my voice has only just started to get better and sound somewhat normal I feel like I still sound a bit gross but I really wanted to film this video and get a video up for you guys I'm so sorry I haven't posted in like three weeks by this point it wasn't planned it wasn't intended I hate missing uploads but it was needed so that I could get better so yeah thank you so so much for being really really patient with me and thank you for all the lovely comments and messages asking if I was okay I'm absolutely fine now hopefully I'm on the other side of it so I can get back to posting on YouTube. But anyway, this week I have an unsolved case to share with you, an unsolved disappearance case, because today we are going to be talking about Antoinette Cayadito. She was a young Native American girl who just completely vanished one night in the middle of the night in 1986, and she has never been seen since. Well, she might have been, there have been reported sightings of Antoinette over the years, which we'll talk more about later on and there was even one instance where the police believed they received contact from Antoinette herself. Antoinette has been missing for more than 35 years now and we still have no idea what happened to her all those years ago. So as always when I cover unsolved cases I will leave some contact details in the description box in case anyone watching this has any information regarding Antoinette's disappearance. But quickly before we get into the case I would just like to say a huge huge thank you to Skillshare for kindly sponsoring this section of the video. If you have never heard of Skillshare before it is an online learning community with millions of members who come together to take the next step in their creative journey. Skillshare is a platform that offers thousands of incredible and inspiring classes on a huge variety of topics. So for example they have classes in graphic design design, photography, video, creative writing, animation, freelancing and so so much more. So whether you want to fall back into an old hobby or you want to develop a new skill and learn something new completely, there will be something on Skillshare for you. Skillshare classes include a combination of video lessons and a class project and one thing that I really like about it is that most of the classes are under 60 minutes and the lessons within the classes are short. So if you find that you don't really have much spare time, say you only have 10 minutes free time every day, you can still use that 10 minutes productively by sitting down and taking a short lesson on Skillshare. One class that I have taken recently is this one, Hand Lettering in Procreate, Fundamentals to Finishing Touches by Gia Graham. One of my main hobbies is illustration. I absolutely love to draw and create artwork on my iPad and I would love to start my own little stationery and illustration business one day. So this class has been so, so useful for me. It's really helped to develop my lettering skills. In particular, one of the lessons that I found the most helpful was lesson 11 about tricky letters, letters that are a little bit more difficult to draw because I always really struggle drawing the letter S and making it look nice and neat. But Gia shared some really great tips and methods where instead of drawing it in one like continuous curve, 
you can break it down and draw the S in sections. I really, really enjoyed this class and I highly recommend it if you are also into illustration and you want to develop your lettering skills. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, which means that there are no ads on the videos so you can stay focused on the lessons at all times. And they are constantly releasing new premium classes, allowing you to follow wherever your creativity takes you. So if you would like to give Skillshare a try, then now is definitely the time to do it because they are currently offering the first 1,000 of my subscribers that click the link in my description box a one month free trial of Skillshare. Once again, that's the first 1,000 of you guys that click the link in my description box a one month free trial. A big, big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. And now let's just get into the case. So for today's case, we are going all the way back to the year 1986 in Gallup, which is a city in New Mexico in the US. Gallup was a fairly quiet area in New Mexico. It had a population of about 18,000 people and one family that resided there was the Caedito family. The Caedito family consisted of Penny Caedito and her three children. She had three daughters named Wendy, Sadie and the oldest, Antoinette, who was nine years old at the time of this case taking place. The girl's father was a man named Anthony, I believe, although some sources stated that his name was Larry, so I'm not too sure what's accurate there. Perhaps one of those was a nickname. I think for the purpose of this video, I'll call him Anthony because most sources refer to him as Anthony. But anyway, he didn't live with the rest of the family because he and Penny had separated by this point. So it was just Penny and her three girls living living in the home. Antoinette Caedito was born on the 25th of December, so Christmas Day of 1976. As I said, she was just nine years old, but she was incredibly independent for her age and wise beyond her years. Antoinette, who was nicknamed Squirrel by her family, was described as being a very dependable, trustworthy and friendly young girl with a big heart and she was also extremely caring. She she cared for her two little sisters so much. She was honestly like a second mother to them. When their mother Penny was busy, Antoinette would tend to Wendy and Sadie. She would make them food, she would dress them and iron their clothes. She was just a natural nurturer, even at just nine years old. But she wasn't just like that with her sisters at home. Her school peers said that Antoinette was the same at school. She would always stick up for her peers and she always always just cared for others. She always wanted to help and support other people. She had such a huge heart. And speaking of school, she always did very well in her education. She attended Lincoln Elementary School. She was in the fourth grade and she was very smart and intelligent. She also really enjoyed sports. In fact, she actually received a fitness award while she was in the fourth grade because she was really good at sports. Antoinette's favourite colour was purple she loved listening to music and her favourite artists were Michael Jackson and Ronnie Millsap. She was very passionate and devoted to her faith and she enjoyed Bible studies. Antoinette was just a very special young girl, a young girl who was so mature and independent for her age, a young girl who didn't have any problems with anyone, which is why it was such a shock when she suddenly went missing one night in April of 1986. It was the 5th of April 1986 and that evening Antoinette and her two sisters had been left at home with a babysitter because their mother Penny was out that night with her friends. They were at a local bar and they were just having a couple of drinks. Penny returned home from her night out at around midnight the next day, so the 6th of April, and she sent the babysitter home and some sources state that Antoinette was actually still awake when her mother got back. So the two of them stayed up and they chatted for a little while before they both went to bed. The next morning at around 7am, Penny woke up and she started waking her daughters up too because they needed to get ready for Bible school. However, when Penny got to Antoinette's room, she realised that Antoinette wasn't in her bed. So she and the other two girls started looking for her around the house, but they couldn't find Antoinette 
anywhere and Penny also noticed that the front door was unlocked and she knew that she had locked it the night before. But I don't think Penny was too worried initially. According to a couple of sources, she actually assumed that Antoinette had gone out that morning looking for a missing dog. You see, one of the neighbor's dogs was actually missing. So the children in the area, including Antoinette, had been helping to look for it in the last couple of days. And so, yeah, Penny just thought, oh, she's gone out to look for the dog. However, when Penny started asking around the neighbours, she realised that none of them had actually seen Antoinette. And it was at this point that Penny really started to worry because the only reasonable explanation she could come up with for why Antoinette wasn't in the house was that she had gone out to look for this missing dog. But clearly that wasn't the case. So where was she? Where had she gone? Penny just started searching around the local area alongside the neighbours. A lot of them had decided to join in and help look for Antoinette but there was nothing they couldn't find her anywhere and so soon after this Penny got in contact with the police and she reported her eldest daughter as missing. So the Gallup police began a search for Antoinette and this case was obviously very very worrying. A nine-year-old girl had gone missing in the middle of the night it seemed and it was immediately feared that Antoinette had been abducted and alongside searching for Antoinette the police also began speaking to and questioning pretty much everyone that knew her because if she was kidnapped from her home in the middle of the night chances are she had to have known the identity of her abductor because the abductor knew where she lived. So they questioned and took statements from family members, in particular the family members that were in the house that night. Obviously Antoinette's mother and her sisters and they also questioned friends of the family and people that lived nearby. Meanwhile as all of this was going on the search for Antoinette intensified. More police officers joined the search. In fact the state police were even brought in to help alongside the local Gallup police force. The neighbours continued to assist with the search and a lot of volunteers also came forward. The whole community really just came together to help in any way that they could. As well as searching, they were also printing off flyers and posters with Antoinette's um, face on and details about her physical appearance. But unfortunately, despite this, the police received very little leads. So to try and encourage more people to come forward that might have any information about Antoinette's whereabouts, a reward of $500 was offered and this was later increased to $1,000. And eventually, the police did receive some information from a neighbour of the Caeditos. The neighbours were obviously all questioned as part of this inquiry, and this one neighbour in particular, I believe it was an elderly lady, she said that early in the morning, at around 6.30am on the day that Antoinette disappeared, she saw a brown truck, an old brown truck, parked close to the Caeditos house. And she saw a man get out of this truck and walk towards the house. Now at the time that this happened the woman didn't really think too much into this. I mean it was just a man walking towards the Caedito house. Why would she think any different? But then when she heard about Antoinette that she had disappeared at some point from her home in the early hours of that morning she decided to let the police know what she saw. And when Antoinette's family were informed of this lead they said that they didn't know anyone that owned a brown truck. So although the police initially theorised that Antoinette's abductor was someone that knew the Caeditos, this lead suggested that maybe that wasn't the case. Maybe they didn't know the identity of the person responsible for Antoinette's disappearance because they didn't know anyone with an old brown truck. And following this lead, the police actually received information about a potential suspect in the investigation. As part of the missing persons inquiry, a lot of the local neighbourhood children were spoken to by the police just to see if maybe they could provide any important information. And some of the young boys from the neighbourhood told the police about a local 
62 year old man named Wesley Daniels who was a paedophile. He used to take the boys on picnics and whilst there he would sexually assault them and apparently he did this with at least four young boys between the ages of 9 and 11. According to online sources, Daniels was arrested and charged for these assaults, although I'm actually not sure if he ever went to prison. If he didn't, then that is insane. But I do know that he was free at the time of Antoinette's disappearance. In fact, he was actually in the same neighbourhood at the time, so many suspected that maybe he was involved in her disappearance. No one knew of any links between Wesley Daniels and Antoinette, like as far as anyone knew he never abused her. The young boys that came forward to the police said that Antoinette was never at these picnics that Daniels held. He was questioned about Antoinette's disappearance but he claimed that he had nothing to do with it and the police could never find any evidence to suggest otherwise to suggest that he was involved and so I believe he was completely ruled out. And unfortunately following this the police didn't really receive any more tips. They were really struggling with this case to be honest because they had absolutely nothing to go on. There's seemed to be no trace of Antoinette anywhere. They didn't even know if she was dead or alive and soon days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months and over time this missing persons inquiry really started to slow down because they had no leads to investigate. Soon Christmas Day of 1986 rolled around which was of course a really really difficult time for the Caeditos. Not only because it was Christmas which is obviously a time that you spend with family but also because if you remember that day was Antoinette's birthday she was born on the 25th of December and that year she would have turned 10 and they had to go through her 10th birthday without her having no idea where she was or what was currently happening to her but to still try and celebrate her birthday the Caeditos put a picture of Antoinette right at the very top of their Christmas tree where usually people put a star or an angel. But yeah, everything with the case seemed to go quiet for a while with little leads. The police really didn't have much to look into. But then suddenly, out of the blue, just over a year after Antoinette was last seen, the police received a huge, huge lead in the case when it seemed as though they received contact from Antoinette herself. On the 12th of April 1987, the Gallup police received a phone call from a young girl that said she was Antoinette Caredito, and I will play that phone call for you right now. Okay, whereabouts in Albuquerque? Hello? Antoinette, where are you? Antoinette? Hello? So that was the phone call that the Gallup police received and very, very unfortunately, because the call was only about 40 seconds long, the police couldn't trace it in 1987. They couldn't trace where it had been made from. Of course, the girl on the phone claiming to be Antoinette said that she was in Albuquerque, but if that was true, the police couldn't determine where in Albuquerque the call was being made from. But the police took the phone call recording and they played it to Penny Caredito, Antoinette's mother. And as soon as she heard it, she was like, yep, that's Antoinette. Penny listened to that phone call countless times over and over again. And just from the way in which Antoinette said her last name, Caredito, and the way she screamed, Penny was certain that that was her daughter on the other end of the line. However, Penny didn't know who the man's voice was, the voice that said, who said you could use the phone. It was a voice that she didn't recognise. Honestly, I can't even imagine how hard it must have been for the family to listen to that call because if that really was Antoinette, then she was clearly in 
distress. She's clearly terrified, but still the police were no closer to finding her and saving her. Some people do theorise that the phone call was a fake because Antoinette's case was pretty huge news in the US, so it's not impossible that it was a hoax and the caller was just pretending to be Antoinette. But as I said, Antoinette's own mother was so, so sure that that was her child. She said that as a mother, she knows. She knows her own child's voice and scream and that was Antoinette. Less than two years after the phone call was made, in January of 1989, the audio recording was played on radio stations. The police were hopeful that someone might recognise either the young girl's voice or the man's voice that was heard at the end, but sadly this again resulted in zero credible leads. About four years after Antoinette was last seen, the police worked with the FBI and they created two computer enhanced pictures of what Antoinette may have looked like if she was still alive because at this point she would have been 14 years old, she would have been a teenager. These pictures were then released to the public and again the police were hoping that it might result in new people coming forward with information. Maybe someone would recognise Antoinette through the pictures and contact the police. And following this I believe quite a few reported sightings of Antoinette were put forward. There were alleged sightings of her from Florida, Pennsylvania, Utah, Michigan. There were honestly reported sightings from all over the US which were looked into and the majority resulted in dead ends. However, there was one reported sighting that came in 1991 that the police strongly believed wasn't just another dead end. They really believed that this sighting in particular could have been Antoinette Cardito. The sighting was from an area called Carson City in Nevada, which is about 870 miles away from Gallup in New Mexico, where Antoinette was from. And it was reported by a woman who worked as a waitress in a restaurant in Carson City. This woman said that one day she was at work, obviously waitressing, and at one point she was waiting on a table where three people were sitting. It was a man and a a woman, probably a couple, sitting at this table who the waitress described as looking, quote, unkempt. And also with them was a young girl who she believed was probably around the age of 14, 15. So the waitress was serving them, she was bringing them their food and drinks, and she noticed that throughout their entire stay, the young 14, 15 year old girl kept dropping her utensils on the floor whenever the waitress came to the table. So the waitress would bend down and pick up the utensils and put them back on the table and each time she did, the young girl would grab the waitress's hand and just squeeze it, squeeze it quite hard. And at the time, the waitress didn't really think much of it. However, later on, when the three people left, the unkempt couple and the young girl, she went back to the table to collect the plates and clean it up. And when she picked up the plate that the young girl was eating from, she found that a napkin was underneath it, almost like it had been hidden under there. And on this napkin, there was a note that read, quote, help me call the police and that was when it all started to make sense to the waitress that was why the young girl kept dropping her utensils and squeezing her hand she was desperately trying to get her attention because she clearly needed help but maybe she couldn't make it obvious because of the people that she was sitting with so as soon as she found the napkin the waitress immediately got in contact with the police and the police went to the scene but by the time they arrived there was no sign of the young girl or the man and woman that she was sat with, they couldn't trace them. But many people do believe that this sighting, this 14, 15 year old girl, was Antoinette Caedito. And I believe the waitress did say that she looked similar to Antoinette and Antoinette would have been around that same age if she was still alive. She would have been 14, 15 by this point. And if that was the case, if this really was Antoinette, then this unkempt couple were probably her abductors that were holding her captive and Antoinette was 
desperately trying to escape them and get help. However, just like the phone call, this reported sighting has never been confirmed to have been Antoinette Caedito. So it may have been her or it may not have been. The police couldn't be certain because they could never track the three people down. But following this potential lead, the detectives investigating Antoinette's case decided to speak to the members of the Caedito family again, the ones that were in the house on the night that Antoinette went missing, just to go through their statements again. And this obviously included her younger sisters, Wendy and Sadie. And when they spoke to Wendy, she provided some groundbreaking information about that night, information that she hadn't told the police before. Now when Antoinette disappeared in 1986, Wendy was just five years old, however now when she was being re-interviewed she was 10 years old. And when she spoke to the police this second time, she told them that that night, the night that her older sister went missing, she remembered someone knocking on the front door and she said that she and Antoinette heard it whilst Penny and Sadie were in bed. So after hearing this knock, Antoinette got up and she went towards the door and Wendy followed behind her. And when she got to the door, Antoinette began asking who was there, to which the person on the other side replied, it's Uncle Joe. And so Antoinette opened the door to let them in. However, when she did, Wendy witnessed two men grab Antoinette and Antoinette was kicking her feet and saying let me go let me go but they didn't and instead they carried her to a brown van that was parked just outside the home which if you remember is similar to the one the neighbour saw parked outside the home that morning she said that she also saw a brown truck but anyway Wendy said that they carried Antoinette to the truck they forced her into it and then they drove away and that was the last time Wendy ever saw her big sister. Unfortunately, Wendy couldn't describe what these two men looked like because she didn't really get a good look at their faces and this was obviously five years later. And speaking of five years later, the detectives asked Wendy why it had taken her so long to tell them all of this. Why didn't she tell them about these two men and the brown truck when Antoinette first went missing? And Wendy said that she didn't tell them before because she she was scared. She was so scared that she would get in trouble if she told them. And I imagine she was probably scared that the two men might come back for her too. Remember, she was only five years old. Now, again, just like with the phone call and the reported sighting, the police couldn't be 100% certain that this story was true because it had taken Wendy so long to tell them. But they did strongly believe that she was telling the truth. They didn't think she was making it up. They believed Wendy's version of events that Antoinette was kidnapped by two men that night. Now, like we talked about, according to Wendy's version of events, when Antoinette went to the front door and she asked who was there, one of the men said that it was Uncle Joe. And Antoinette did actually have an Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe was Penny Caedito's sister's husband, so it was Penny's brother-in-law. So after they received this new information from Wendy, the police questioned and interviewed Uncle Joe, thinking that maybe he had something to do with his niece's disappearance. But they were soon able to determine that he was innocent. He had a concrete alibi for the time of the abduction and he had a witness to back up his alibi. So he was not considered a suspect in the case. But this Uncle Joe lead did suggest to the police that, again, the person who abducted Antoinette was probably someone that knew the Caedito family because they had to have known that Antoinette had an Uncle Joe. If the kidnapper hadn't said that it was Uncle Joe that night, then Antoinette probably wouldn't have opened the door because she was a sensible young girl. It's very unlikely that she would have opened it to someone that she didn't know, but she thought it was her uncle, so she did open it. In the years that followed Antoinette's disappearance, her mother Penny and two sisters, Wendy and Sadie, went to go and see 
see a woman who performed um, like tribal ceremonies and crystal rituals and she claimed that she could contact the spirits of missing people. I think Penny Caudito was just so desperate at this point. She was desperate to know what had happened to her daughter and so she went to see if this woman could contact Antoinette. And during this ritual, the woman said that she believed Antoinette was still alive out there somewhere and that she may even have her own child by this point. The woman also said that Antoinette was currently being held captive against her will somewhere in the south west of the US but she couldn't say where specifically. From what I can gather, Penny Caudito went to visit this woman a couple of times over the years and she said that visiting her brought her some form of comfort and it gave her strength because she believed that Antoinette was alive and that gave her some relief and some hope. But speaking of Penny Caudito, some people do actually have their theories that maybe she was somehow involved in her daughter's disappearance. Or maybe not so much involved, but people think that she knew more than she was letting on because as I've said many times throughout this video, the police strongly believed that Antoinette was abducted by someone that knew the family. So maybe Penny knew that person and was reluctant to come forward for whatever reason. According to a couple of sources, after Antoinette's disappearance, Penny did a polygraph test alongside Antoinette's father, Anthony, and the results of Penny's test vary depending on which source you read. Some sources say that she passed the polygraph whereas others say that she failed it and other sources say that she took two tests. The first one she passed and the second one she failed. So I really don't know what is accurate there but to be honest polygraph tests are not the most reliable anyway. I've also seen a few people online question why Penny didn't wake up that night, the night that Antoinette went missing. They said well if there was a knock at the door that night why didn't Penny hear it? How come Antoinette and Wendy heard it but Penny didn't? And how did Penny not hear Antoinette kicking and shouting let me go when she was grabbed by the two men. But then a possible explanation that there could be for this was that if you recall from early on in the video, the evening before this all happened, the Caredito girls were being looked after by a babysitter because Penny had gone out to a local bar to have a couple of drinks with friends. So I imagine she was slightly intoxicated that night and so she probably just crashed when she went to bed and was deep in her sleep. I don't know for certain that she was drinking alcohol that night but if she was then that might explain why she didn't wake up when she went to bed. Or maybe she was just a deep sleeper in general and wouldn't usually hear things in the night if you know what I mean. So like for example I am quite a light sleeper. Any slight noise in the night will wake me up immediately whereas my sister is a very deep sleeper. When she is asleep she is asleep and no amount of noise would wake her up. So perhaps that was the same with Penny and so that's why she didn't hear the knock at the door and Antoinette shouting. But anyway, regardless, some people had their doubts about Penny's story. Although from what I can gather, there was never any evidence to suggest that Penny had anything to do with it. But if she did, we will probably never know now because Penny Caudito passed away in 1999 and Antoinette's father, he passed away in 2012. As I said earlier, over the years there have been several reported sightings of Antoinette from all around the country but none of these have ever been confirmed and Antoinette Caudito has never been found to this day. Age progression photos have been created and released to the public showing what she may have looked like if she was still alive. The most recent age progression photo is the one on screen right now showing what Antoinette would have possibly looked like around 39 years old and as of today in 2021 she would be around 45 if she is still alive. There has been speculation that a couple of Jane Doe's could have been Antoinette Caudito 
for starters, there is a case known as the Bernalillo County Jane Doe. Bernalillo County is in Albuquerque in New Mexico, and there, in May of 1996, about 10 years after Antoinette was last seen, human remains were found wrapped in about six plastic bags, and these remains were determined to have been that of a female somewhere between the ages of 14 to 19. She was believed to have been either Hispanic or Native American and she had multiple fractures on the left side of her skull, indicating that her cause of death was probably a head injury, although apparently this has not been confirmed. Unfortunately, this Jane Doe has never been identified to this day, but many people do theorise that maybe it was Antoinette Caedito, although apparently this has been ruled out by the National Missing and Unidentified Person Centre. They do not believe that this Jane Doe was Antoinette. Another Jane Doe that has been mentioned in relation to this case is the Apache Junction Jane Doe from Arizona. In August of 1992, over six years after Antoinette disappeared, a decomposed body was discovered in a desert-like area called Apache Junction near Highway 60. The body was that of a young woman, probably between the age of 16 to 18, however a cause of death could not be determined and she has never been identified. There are a couple of reconstruction images of this Jane Doe which I will put on screen now and again just like the last one some people speculated that maybe it was Antoinette but eventually this theory was also ruled out. Antoinette is not believed to have been the Apache Junction Jane Doe. But that is pretty much it for this case. A bit of an abrupt ending but like I said as of today Antoinette Caedito has never been found. I think her case is still classed as a missing persons case but apparently the police haven't received any new leads in years. But I believe the case is still open to this day so if anyone watching this has any information regarding Antoinette's disappearance I will leave the relevant contact details in the description box. As always please do let me know your theories and thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments. I look forward to reading them. Before I go I would just like to thank Skillshare once again for sponsoring this video. Remember they are offering the first 1,000 of you that click the link in the description box a one month free trial. Thank you all so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye guys!